We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and as always, the yank to my yin, Susan Hobson, is here. Susan, how are you? I'm fabulous. The sun is out here in Toronto, so we're all doing the sun dance because I read an article this week that this was the darkest winter we've had in 80 years. I feel like that puts a whole new lens of appreciation on some of the sessions I've been fielding this winter. (laughs) (laughs) But nonetheless, it's sunny, so we're we're ready for spring. How about you, sir? Well, actually, so speaking of that, I am literally seven days away from moving to Costa Rica, so I'm going to get the sunshine and the Pura Vida, as they say. Oh, I so can hardly I'm pumped wait. for that. <laughs> so many exciting things happening to you lately, sir. I just got to say something in the uh, air for, for Rob's energy. You're manifesting all these amazing experiences. What do you think about that? It's It's interesting, right? And I forget who I was speaking to earlier this week, but someone said to me, they were like, if I had a choice and... That's where I want folks to be is you do have a choice. Uh And I don't know if I've shared this story on the pod before, but it was just pre-COVID. So January 2020, we we went to, and Balia and I went to Hawaii for her friend's wedding. And Uh this was when I was like really in the midst of a war with my parts and everything was really bad. And we went to a beach and they had a bunch of these Volkswagen vans and like- The Shagan wagons. Yeah. And it was like these surfer guys (laughs) that lived on the beach and they were like selling mangoes for like a dollar a piece. And like, they just lived on the beach. Yeah. And there was like a part of me that was like, I would love to do that. And then obviously there's the manager firefighters were like, we're never going to let you do that. (laughs) And so it was just an interesting dichotomy. And this is the interesting part about parts work, right? Is Mm -hmm. is you start to uncover these things and then you can start to, one is build trust with your protectors, but also Mm -hmm. it's being able to access choice as big as self. Mm -hmm. And on that note, friend of the show, uh, big congratulations to Dick Schwartz. He won the Lifetime Achievement Award from Ooh. Psychotherapy Networker. So wow. just big shout out to him. Um, mm-hmm. Congratulations. No and on that note, there. <laughs> that's right. And on that note, we have to start off with a quote. Uh-huh. So I have one here from Morihai Yushiba. And he says... Those who are enlightened never start forging themselves. Tell us why you picked that one today. Well, returning to the show, special guest who just finished uh, writing his book or the book came out, the author of Expand the Circle and the godfather of talent optimization, Matt Popesel is back. Matt, how are you? I'm doing great, Rob and Susan. Thank you so much for having me back. It's incredible to have you back. And for folks out there, if you want to check out Matt's first episode with us, which was episode 24, People Are the Last Competitive Advantage. It came out July 2021. (laughs) That's why we said blast from the past. Max back in studio. That's right. So much has changed since then. It's amazing. Let's start there, maybe. Hey, let's talk. Let's. First, plug our audience into who you are and the mission that you're on, just in case they haven't yet checked out episode 24. And then tell us a little bit about what you've been up to since. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who don't know, I uh, started my my first civilian job was in the, I should say my first job was in the U.S. Marine Corps. That was my first adult job, as I meant to say. Yeah. And so I, I did six years as an Arabic linguist and a parachutist, and I did all the fun uh, jumping out of planes kind of stuff. And I knew as soon as I got out, I was going to go into the business world to around, I was fascinated with technology and these sorts of things. What I learned immediately was all the attention that we paid to leadership when I was in the military, that didn't really happen the same way in the civilian world. And the techniques I had used in the military didn't translate all that well to the civilian world. So I had to, as a a first line product manager, I had to kind of rebuild my leadership approach, which was 
a lot of a lot of fun. But I enjoyed managing people and, and leading people and learning and studying so much that I went and got my PhD in psychology, studying leadership and coaching and all these fun things. And that was all going really, really well right up until the pandemic. And all of a sudden, I ended up having the big reset button like many of us did. And it led me to, to re-examine sort of what I really knew about leadership. And I became interested in Eastern philosophy and cosmology and quantum physics and all kinds of sort of fundamental things about life and the universe and all these fun things, too. So as I look back, I was go- I went through these different phases of being a warrior, being a scholar, being a sage. And what I delight in right now is just absolutely sort of stitching these things together and bringing them into leadership frame in an entirely new way. So I'd love to hear more about yeah. that journey, uh, Matt. Like, what was that journey into, I guess we would call it wisdom traditions? How was that for you? Yeah, it was probably about uh, 20 years I had been operating in primarily software companies and either product development or or consulting roles and and really enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed it. I love studying leadership and, and uh, just business in general. So that part was all going really well. And as soon as the pandemic happened and... I remember talking to our CFO and I was like, you think we'll really have to go home for like two weeks? <laughs> two weeks. Oh my two gosh, what was, I, I what was I thinking? So, you know, you start to go back and you realize as the, the pandemic unfolded, it led many of us to this sort of question or our, our reprioritize, I should say, our values. What really matters to us? And like many people, uh, the question of work came up. Like, what is it? What role do I want work to play in my life? What is it that I want to bring to my work? And I started to feel this this sort of disconnect between what I thought success was for me, because I'd been on a certain path. But then I realized, and I used the metaphor of like, I'm on the service road. There's a super highway of success right next to me. So I'm not totally off, but I'm, I just can't find the on-ramp. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I wasn't really showing up for my people as as the leader that I wanted to be. And I had no idea why. And so I'm I'm kind of going through this and I'm in my head trash a little bit. And then my father got a call from his oncologist and he had a cancerous uh, tumor on his kidney. And so he would go through this really lengthy recovery process and it brought my mortality right to me. And I thought, oh, we know how this ends, right? So I started to kind of go back to some wisdom traditions that I hadn't touched in 15 years. And I plop myself back down on a meditation cushion and I stink at meditation. I try so hard. <laughs> and, get, and so I'm thinking about work as I'm sitting there, which I, yeah. I probably shouldn't be doing. But what hit me like a ton of bricks was there are these intrinsic connections between wisdom traditions, between leadership, and it really unlocked for me this possibility and so I, it helped me find my way back. And I use that in a combination with therapeutic technique, acceptance and commitment therapy, found an amazing book called Liberated Mind. Uh, it, from, it, it just it really helped me to sort of look at my thoughts and, and look at my experience from an entirely different perspective. And uh, a combination of those things really helped me you know, get my way back to who I wanted to be for my team and, and, uh, and have more of the experience that I wanted in my life. What was that bridge that was tying those two worlds together? I think there's a, just a fundamental thread of unity. And when I stopped trying to hold back all these different parts of my life, like they had to be separate, and I almost allowed the world to sort of collapse in upon me, I have never been happier. It was just a matter of saying, like, I don't have to be somebody different at work versus at home versus in my brain and and these sorts of things. I found connections and I really started to let go of some things in a way that before I would have thought this is going to harm my performance. This is going to change the way I'm looked at. And I found something that just made me willing to be vulnerable to my team and, and people around me to show up and, and, and to connect with them more deeply than I ever had before. And uh, I just got a lot more clarity. And I think that that really made all the difference. Oh it's gosh. interesting, right? And I I talked about this concept with Sonny Strasberg. And actually, for folks, mm-hmm. if you're interested in learning more about the wisdom traditions, skip back a few weeks ago in podcast world and listen to the episode with Nikos Patadakis. It's a two-parter, but we dive a lot into traditional philosophy. And there's incredible ties to a lot of what we're talking about today. But Matt, um, I guess 
for you, like you mentioned, there was something that allowed you to become more vulnerable and let go of these protector parts that were saying, you know, put the armor on, show up and be, you know, this leader or manager or the guy. Like, what was that like for you? And how did you end up allowing those to relax? I think that having been the product of of a Western upbringing, you know, there was very much a focus on leaders that are like these these individuals, these incredibly mavericky Steve Jobs, Elon Musk type people. We celebrate sort of these independent people as if they did everything on their own. And it really just builds up. And there's so much uh, consumerism and so much that really uh, stokes that 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 the me issues or the the me approach. Like I need to accomplish this or or do these things. And and so I have had a a long track record of of achieving things. And and that was it's great to achieve things. It's great to have goals. But what I found is that when I would earn the title of being a US Marine or I earned a PhD or I finished an Ironman triathlon, they never really gave me lasting happiness. They were important milestones and achievements, but the more I pursued my own self-interest, the further away from happiness I got. And it's not like I was absent and I don't have needs. Of course I do. But the more I over, if I over index or I focus too much on myself, it just, it just absolutely robbed me of anything good in life. The more I could attune myself to the needs of other people, to their interests, to the mission, the more I was willing to let go of myself in this process. And this is where many wisdom traditions tell us to do. It just gave me a sense of connection and contentment, and even to myself that I just never had before. So I found that that um, that was a really powerful transition for me. But here I am in a Western world, in a traditional leadership role. You can't just come to people and say, oh, I've got the answer. Just sit on this meditation cushion and think about nothing for, you know, <laughs> umpteen. You know, that, doesn't, that doesn't really oh. work. And that's what led me to write the book was to say, how can I create accessibility to some of these concepts that have helped me so much that I know are are very much in need right now because of all the changes we've seen in the world. And uh, I'm just thrilled to have had the opportunity and and uh, blessed for the opportunity to be able to, to uh, create it. So what are some of those new insights that have changed your approach to leadership? Yeah, I would look around and I, I certainly had my experience. I've shared a little bit of it here. I definitely would look around and see other people struggling as well. And there was no rhyme or reason. There was no socioeconomic boundary. There was no a particular function, industry, no one was pr- protected. People are struggling and they're still struggling to this day. Mm-hmm. And the reason I went and studied psychology and the reason I, I, what I love best about leadership is being able to help people and being able to help them to either find success and happiness or to remove some of the suffering, the challenges they have. And so when I had to step back, I had to say, why is this happening? What has changed that's led to this, this disconnect? This People are disenfranchised from work. Mm-hmm. And so I started everything I look at in the world of work, I really break down into three areas. What's the work to be done? Who's doing the work? And who's leading the charge? It's really any problem in an organization and any opportunity in an organization comes down to those three things. Well, when I looked at work, work we do today is totally different than what we did, you know, when, <laughs> when we first started as humans, as you know, mm-hmm. uh, hunter-gatherers, et cetera go all the way through the industrial revolution, even now into, into knowledge work, shared work. The, the nature of how work gets done in most organizations is unrecognizable. So there's been this tremendous evolution. <laughs> when you look at the worker, what we used to have to forage for food and we used to have to struggle to try to meet our basic needs, that's not the issue now. People can move around jobs, they can get their needs met pretty easily, but there's a new set of needs that we experience when it comes to work. Ooh. And I call these the three Bs. Being, belonging, something bigger than myself. This is what people want. And actually, I call them the killer bees because if you don't meet these needs, it kills your productivity, it kills your performance, your intent to stay. Only bad things happen. So I'm looking at this evolution of work and the worker. Now it's time to talk about who's leading the charge. I haven't seen evolution in leadership. I see a lot of outdated attitudes, beliefs. I see things that were invented decades ago still being foisted upon our leaders, teaching them the operations of a business, the technology bits, but not embracing the human aspects of of leadership in a way that actually works. So we have to evolve leadership. And that's what led me to discover that the future of leadership is an enlightened leadership. So let's, let's go, go there, there next. 
Yeah, let's go there. Like that in obviously enlightenment, a lot of folks, or at least the perception is, it's like you're the Buddha sitting under a tree and um, you start floating <laughs> or something, or there's a, yeah. there's some glowing behind you. Um, and obviously that's not the case. But yeah. let's talk about like what is enlightened leadership and how does that like how do we get that into you know an IT office or like a, a mine or a manufacturing yeah. plant. Yeah. Like if you think about the term itself in the Eastern traditions, you're right. That when we think about enlightenment, sometimes it's either harmony with nature, maybe it's realization of an ultimate truth. These, these are, are very common, um, you know, definitions of enlightenment, but even in the West, the age of enlightenment happened in the late uh, 17th century where we started to move away from monarchies and, and you saw these ideals that we, take for granted today in some ways around liberty and the role of the individual and, and inalienable rights, uh, things like tolerance. So enlightenment is part of the Western tradition as well in that sense that we have to move from outdated practices and attitudes and beliefs. And that's the term that inspired me to use it when it comes to leadership. So it's all about moving away from those, those outdated notions of what a leader is supposed to be and how we're supposed to behave because they're not working anymore. The, the, uh -huh. They're not allowing us to connect with our people. And whether it's Gen Z leaders, whether it's millennial leaders, all the way through to the C-suite is just it's just breaking down. So enlightenment, in my view, is really about driving up things like mindfulness, like compassion, like wisdom, and driving down that overemphasis on self. When we can do those things, then all of a sudden, I believe that you know a, a more enlightened form of leadership allows us to address those killer bees that I talked about earlier and to allow us to actually produce better business results. That was the big surprise of, of, uh, that I had with all this, is it's not walking away from the reality of the hard needs of a business. We actually get those things when we change the way that we lead people. Totally. And, and I mean, we talk about that a lot on the show. And, and folks, if you go back something like four to six weeks, our episode with Jason Lippert is proof mm -hmm. in the pudding on that and oh, the yeah. growth they've had, not to mention their incredible results. So Matt, I guess, I mean, this is something that Susan and I are super passionate about is like, how do we start changing those folks that are holding on to this oh, grip of, I need to be the guy like, basically narcissistic or egocentric bosses, how how do we pierce their armor to get them to open up to even considering that there's a different way? Yeah, I think we have to define and help them redefine what success really is. You know, when I talk to, uh, to leaders today and, and they look at the results, they know that they're not getting the results that they really want and need. They're either seeing turnover because people have choices, they're not going to put up with ego, egoistic bosses. Um, or they're just, some of them are just disappointed because they're like, I, I want my team to be having a better go of it. And they're not like, what, what's missing in my leadership that's leading to, to these poor outcomes. And I, I think that that's really about trying to say, like, are we truly being successful? And it's about helping to reexamine, you know, that that lens of, of what we really need. What is our role as leaders? That's, that's a big part of it. When I talk to leaders who are up and coming today, aspiring leaders, they tell me that like, it's almost impossible to try to figure it out on my own. I'll go do a Google search. I'll get a million results. I'll be halfway through an article and realize this doesn't really apply to me. Like there's no simple framework or there's no, I can't, how do I know I'm making progress? I feel like I have to, you know, shout myself out and promote myself if I'm going to get noticed and that feels gross. Like these are the types of things they focus on on the surface, right? But when you go a little bit deeper and you start asking to them like, what is, how do you find that true essence of your leadership? You have to cut through a lot of that fear and a lot of that, well, I'm supposed to, to help them find that real bedrock of what are you all about and, and bring this type of an integrity and wholeness, you know, uh, into, into your leadership. And I think that we have to create the conditions in which it's not even seen as you're willing to do that. I will tell you that in the future, leaders who are unwilling to embrace this very human aspect of leadership are unfit to lead. That is absolutely fundamentally the truth because the nature of what you see from the newest generation to enter the workforce, for example, Gen Z, I always say, I love where Gen Z is leading us. Highest levels of openness, inclusivity, 
uh, commitment, sustainability, service. I've never seen anything like it. However, also bringing tremendous amounts of anxiety, mm-hmm. tremendous amounts of frustration that rents are high, student loans are high, pay is not keeping up, the fear that they have, like the ego drive that's been pounded into them is not serving them well. And this is why we need a more human form of leadership and a more enlightened form of leadership. So I think that I, I like to open the door for a leader to allow them to reevaluate and, and redefine what success really means in terms of leadership. And if they won't walk through that open door, we have to reframe because it just it won't get us the business results we want. It won't get us the people results that we want. And, and the stakes are too high to allow it to go on anymore. Woo. Amen. That's my favorite way to get their attention, right? Which is like just talking about the table stakes are just too high. And if you want to stay in this game and compete, like this is a journey that you have to go on. So I presume this is most of what you're going to learn when you pick up Matt's book, of course. But let's get into the book a little bit more deeply. I'm just curious about the title, Expand the Circle. Where did you grasp that inspiration from? Yeah, that was that happened on the cushion meditation technique. There's a a, a meta meditation which is all about imagining loving kindness, if you will, and you start with yourself and you wish for yourself to be be happy and to be free of suffering, and and then you try to expand that circle of compassion out a little bit more to maybe your family, maybe people who are very close to you in your world. Can you expand it a little further even to your coworkers, maybe to strangers, maybe even to an enemy? Can you keep expanding it all the way out to? really the entire universe, if you will. And so as I'm sitting here listening to this, I thought, oh my God, this is exactly how I have approached leadership. I had to learn to lead myself before I could learn to lead others or lead a team, a little bit more complicated, right? Learn to lead an entire organization and finally lead out into the world. I don't stop being a leader when it's five o'clock or when I'm off, you know, out of work. You know, I'm still operating with my family in my community, I'm still a member of our human society. I'm still a leader. So that's really what led to this this connection of we don't have to just stop with the wisdom traditions and, and, and think of a technique like expanding the circle of compassion. We can create an expansion of the circle of leadership as well. And what I was pleased about is when I started to say, okay, I, I got scared. To be honest with you, I said, I am a Western trained psychologist. I cannot just totally sit down on the cushion and allow this. So I started to break down. What does it mean to lead yourself? And I hit on these elements of you got to have awareness. Self awareness is critical. But you can't stop there. You got to have self acceptance. Uh oh, I know many leaders who don't make it that far, but let's right. keep going. How do you find your self confidence? How do you find authenticity? Right. And then finally, after I've asked you to work so hard on yourself, How do you find self-transcendence? How do you let it all go and realize it's not about you, right? So when I I happened upon this and I started looking at things like self-awareness, there is tremendous amounts of psychology literature, Western studies that prove the relationship between awareness and business outcomes, awareness and people-related outcomes. Everything gets better. So what I did is I used this sort of um, Eastern-inspired framework to go find the Western-focused elements and research that prove that these things work. So it's this interesting fusion of East and West together, all in a way that's very actionable for leaders. And that's why I'm so proud of it. I love it. <laughs> I mean, obviously, <laughs> I think we've gone a very similar path, Matt. And and, and we're not alone, Rob. Yeah. We're not alone. It, People are looking for this in their lives. They're absolutely looking for more at work. They They took work. The average worker is like, not why do I work here? It's why do I work? Like, what role do I want work to play in my life? What do I expect from work? Do I have to just go and earn a paycheck and just get bludgeoned? And no, they're not putting up with it anymore. And in fact, I was talking to a company the other day and they said, we're having trouble with our German uh, Gen Z part of the workforce. I'm like, what? They said, in Germany, we've always had very traditional approaches, very systematic approaches to work. And it's not working anymore with our Gen Z workers. I thought, I have never <laughs> thought about that. It is an absolute global phenomenon that you know, people have gotten to this point where something is missing from their lives. And when you start to think about everybody that goes to work, what kind of experience are we giving them? You know, well, How are we helping them make a, a safe environment for them to explore what they're all about, to really show up fully at work, to create those social bonds with those around them, to be in service and find purpose and meaning in their work? 
if the average leader can't connect the dots for people to those things, that's where I say they're not fit to lead. But we have to train them differently. We have do a tremendous disservice. I mentioned when I started off in the Marine Corps, they worked so hard to make sure that we got the leadership development we needed. In the civilian world, it is pathetic how much we, how, how little I should say we invest in our leaders. And so you can't expect people to just pick this up by osmosis. You have to train leaders. So if you're going to hold leaders accountable the way that they want to hold people accountable, then we've got to invest and create the infrastructure for them to get the good stuff. And uh, that's mm -hmm. the only way I see this works. Where does that training begin? I think this is another thing that we're very passionate about exploring is this whopping gap between when people become leaders on average. I think it's like a decade later, then they finally get the training. And that age is on average, what, 46? Yeah, right. Like, wh where does this begin? Help enlighten our leaders now, Matt. Like, where does yeah. that journey <laughs> need to begin? Day one, day one, because the reality is that there's so many different options when we think about leadership development, whether it's just consuming content, whether it's uh, you know conversing with others, mentoring programs, there's too many options for us to be able to say, well, we it's too expensive, or we have to wait. It's not true. The other thing is the leadership mindset. If you walked into a room of workers and you said, show of hands, how many of you are leaders in this organization? You think all hands would go up? They'd be like, well, I, I don't know. I'm I, am I, I don't feel comfortable calling myself a leader. That's it. Whoa, let's destigmatize the word. Yeah. Like the reality is that I see every worker, every employee, every whatever you call your, your people, a leader, leader at every level. When I got out of the Marine Corps and I was an individual contributor, you better believe I was still a leader because I could lead myself. I could lead my peers. I could lead my projects. Like I always saw myself as a leader. So for me, leadership development began on day one. And so I'm consuming everything I can in my day, Susan and Rob. It was, of course, audio books in my trunk. But, you know, <laughs> if, if it wasn't going to be given to me, I took the initiative to give it to myself. Right. So I felt like if I wanted to grow and I wanted to do right by people and I wanted to uh, you know, put up the type of results, I had to invest in myself. I think companies should do more, but I do think that then there's this really critical transition point when you take on your first management assignment, boy, that's a sensitive time. You yeah. know, on Monday, you were my, you know, you were my peer, but now on Tuesday, I'm your boss. Boy, you really need to support people during that phase. Mm -hmm. Once you start to hit, you know, a wall, if you've kind of uh, you know, started to, to see that you're not getting the effects of the leadership that you want, that can be another opportunity where you need special amounts of leadership development as well. But I think we've got to start early and we have to realize that people develop in different ways. Some people like to kind of go off on their own and read stuff. Some people want to talk it out, group stuff. Uh, some want formalized training. Some need on-the-job training. Sometimes we need to train managers to coach up-and-coming leaders better. Just all of it. Can we just do all of it, please? Like it's <laughs> There's not a better investment we could make considering that our leaders are in the perfect position to connect those dots I talked about. When all of a sudden it's like, I can help you sort of learn and, and create a safe environment for you to discover yourself, to create those critical connections with those around you and see yourself as being part of what we're here to accomplish. And that can fulfill that sense of meaning and purpose that you have. Nobody's in a better position to do it than the person's direct manager. But if we don't train them, it's just not going to work. So I feel like that's what's so critical about this opportunity that we have yeah. is, to, is to meet their needs. And what's at stake is not just business performance, the levels of burnout, the, the levels of mental health issues we see at work, these things are devastatingly concerning if we have the courage to look at what's really happening in our organizations. So I think when you start looking at the, the actual reality of what takes place, not the superficial stuff, but you're willing to go there with people and start to see what's really happening, then all of a sudden I think a, a very different picture emerges, uh, but we don't need to be scared that there's not a solution, there is a solution. Especially at a time where we're still sort of in a talent war, right? Like in terms of all this around quiet quitting, I know it was the great resignation, now it's quiet <laughs> quitting. I mean, it's disengaged, but we're just relabeling it, right? But um, got to ask the godfather of talent himself, like <laughs> the role that all of that plays in terms of retention and optimization would be what? Yeah, I think when you start to meet those needs that we talked about, meet those three killer bees, then all of a sudden everything gets better. The, let's take an example of teams. So if I'm on a team and I'm having a positive experience on that team, what happens is what's known as team commitment goes up. My willingness to work on our work, but also work on our team-based work. So just the way that the team dynamic actually functions, I'm more committed to the team in that way. And so then all of a sudden, when those two things start to happen, we see that team performance goes up. 
Well, if your experience is positive and your commitment is high and your performance is good, what happens to your experience? It goes up even further. So it creates this upward spiral, if you will. So that's kind of what's at stake is if we don't get those things right, we allow people to have a poor experience, their commitment wanes, the performance of the team wanes, inevitably, they're either going to go, like you said, they're going to rage apply to a bunch of other jobs because they just had it, <laughs> or they're going to just sort of say, well, I'm just going to not give it my all. I'm going to do enough not to get fired, but you know, that's you can't expect more from me because my needs aren't getting met. And what I saw some uh, research the other day that an estimated 45 to 75% of Gen Z workers have a side hustle. And you're like, what is that? Why? Well, it's because their needs and their day-to-day job aren't being met. Sometimes they either want more money, they want to provide some balance, they've lost trust in their leadership because we've had so many layoffs and these sorts of things. There's a million reasons for this, but all it's showing you is this fragmentation. And I, I put that squarely at the feet of our leaders. Are we doing enough to create those critical connections we've been talking about? And in too many organizations, the answer is no, we're not. It's, I mean, it's it's absolutely true. And I think we read the same article about poly work, I guess, Matt. <laughs> um, but I guess the question is, is like, for a lot of leaders, this is scary to look at. Because again, it's if I come from this element where I don't accept myself, now I have to look at basically a failure and my self concept cannot allow me to see this. Mm -hmm. How do we start bridging that gap for folks? Yeah, it, it changed for me when I started to realize that I did not have to put this sort of perfect facade out there that I didn't have to judge myself so harshly. I'm known as an insecure overachiever. I've had imposter syndrome for as long as I can remember. My self-worth, despite being a high achiever, was very low. <laughs> when I started to accept these things as just a part of my natural history, and I started to accept that for all the accolades and things that I've received and anything I've achieved, there's an equal number of blemishes and things I'm not altogether proud of. If I can let go of all of it, and just realize that I can settle into myself as a natural, perfectly imperfect person, then I don't have to work so hard. I was exhausted trying to put up this fake facade to the world of saying like, no, you can't see any, any blemishes, no handles, like everything has to be just, just uh, perfect. And it's not possible anyway. So it was so liberating to me to get back my energy of not pretending like I could you know, modify and, and all that impression management. But the other thing that happened for me, Rob, is that I also let go of the fear of being uh, unwilling to incorporate that into my leadership. And the more I would make myself vulnerable, the more I would show people, you know, my my shortcomings or uh, my the, my flaws, my the things that didn't work out for me, it actually created a much deeper connection between myself and those around me. And that allowed me to be a better leader. So all of a sudden, my willingness to do it for them and to put up the result above, prioritize that above my own experience of discomfort. At first, it was hard to do that, but it, boy, it got a lot easier over time. And I am so glad that I did. So I feel like I, I would start small. Yes, you're going to feel the fear, but do it anyway. And, and don't do it for yourself. Do it for them, right? Do it for the people that are in your charge or your peers, your boss, whatever it is. Do it for the people around you, because if you can get past that fear, remember the opposite of fear is not courage. The opposite of fear is love. So if you come from a position of love for your mission and love for the people around you, and you can use that energy to get past your own fears, which is all BS anyway, then all of a sudden things begin to change for you. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. I'm not saying that, but it is so worthwhile. I mean, even yeah. do it for yourself because what folks probably don't know, but maybe feel is just a, an incredible weight of fatigue and responsibility. And as you do the work that Matt's talking about and you learn to accept yourself, and that continues through your life, uh, so don't think it's That's like a, a four-day workshop and you're <laughs> baked, right? No. But it does lift a weight off of you. Yeah. Give you your energy back, and you need that energy. To, to to invest, to reinvest. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm getting a little bit older. You probably can't see if you're on the on the camera. My gray whiskers are starting to come in just just a tiny little bit. <laughs> but as I've gotten older, I like to say that, you know, my my eyesight has grown so weak, I can't see my own flaws. And my hearing so dim, I can't hear my inner critic. And I'm so tired now, I can't even beat myself up anymore. And I said, man, I love growing older. <laughs> and some of that's probably true. Some of that probably just comes from the experience of saying, I'm exhausted with just trying to pretend that everything's going to be perfect. Like I can't show any chinks in my armor. And uh, it is so liberating, like you said, just dropping that weight. And you can just say, I can stand up a little, a little, little taller. I had an executive who I cherish and she pulled me aside and she said, there seems to be a lightness about you. I was like, thank you so much for noticing that because that's exactly how I feel. And I thought, what a great term. What it would, How would work be different if we weren't so pushed down by all that baggage that you're talking about, Rob? But instead, we felt the lightness. We stood up a little straighter. We felt the energy flowing through us and through our leadership and into our people and into the mission that much more uh, in, in a more streamlined way. Boy, it would change our workplaces in a heartbeat. <laughs> it will change our, our workplaces in a heartbeat. Right, gentlemen? <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like that's where I want to go next with you. So you obviously have this amazing perspective with the gray beard and all the sage wisdom that you have, you know, <laughs> cultivated over your years on this journey. But for those who are out there listening, who are feeling that light energy awaken inside of them, listening to this right now. We want everybody who's feeling that to realize that's an acknowledgement, right? Like you're feeling the call to go on this journey. That's oftentimes how it manifests in our experience. But what would your advice be to them at that stage of the journey at the beginning? Yeah, I would say absolutely capitalize on that that energy that you have, you know, that youthful energy that that when something's fresh and new and you could be a 30 year seasoned executive, maybe you take on a new role or you've gone to a new company. There's a, there's energy has a newness to it, or I should say newness has an energy to it. So I think feeding off of that also for aspiring leaders who might be earlier in their careers, if you're listening now, you, you're just naturally more open to these sorts of techniques and practices. I, I think, you know, as, as a Gen X person, when I was in the workforce and we saw millennials come in and millennials would say to us, you know, we want to be heard. We're like, all right, fine. We'll listen. You know, we didn't really have that for us, but it's fine for you. <laughs> Gen Z comes in and says, well, not only do we want to be heard, we want you to change the things that we're not happy about. We're like, what? <laughs> now we have to do more than listen. We have to like change. Well, yes, because so the reality is that for, for aspiring leaders who are a little bit early in their career, you're so much more naturally suited to this sort of thing. Don't let sort of outdated practices and notions and institutionalized fear, I would call it, scare you away from finding that integrity and finding that more natural leadership style that comes to you. I talked to somebody the other day and they said, for the first time, Gen Z managers have been asked to make tough decisions during a reduction in forces, who stays and who goes. And they're really struggling to say, this really conflicts with my values around service and, and, and human kindness and these sorts of compassion, naturally, that's kind of th that we're all about. I have to make these hard business decisions. Like, I don't have a roadmap for this. So this is where I'm saying like, like there's there's a certain hard reality to the business world, whether it's we need to hit certain numbers or, you know, all these kinds of things. You can't let it rob you of your humanity because this is my biggest fear right now about return to office and the tightening of the labor market and economic headwinds. It's going to allow some organizations that are fear based to reclaim some power and to force people into sort of a less human way of of making work choices. And uh, I, I worry about that a lot. It's got my attention right now because that type of mentality is going backwards in time. It is not suited to the future of work. So I think having courage to be able to say people do need flexibility. We do need a human style of leadership. For those of you who are coming up in the ranks and are, are naturally attuned to it, don't stop. Lean into it. Don't lean away from it just because the people you look at at the top of the organization are from a different time. And maybe how they got there was in a different way and they haven't kind of shaken those, those old habits doesn't mean you have to change what's naturally flowing through you in order to be successful. You are the future is what I would say. Ooh, I drop that. You are the future. I love that. I love it. And obviously for aspiring leaders who are listening, we have our own aspiring leaders program that's, Ooh, that's right. either come out or it's coming out shortly 
while you're listening to this. So if you're interested in that, EliteHighPerformance.com. Uh, Matt, is there anything you would like to leave our leaders with before you head on out? Yeah, I think the, the one thing I urge for all leaders is to commit yourself to studying our craft. I think that it's very easy to get busy in the day-to-day -day of the work, but you have to carve out time for yourself, to your point, Rob, earlier, for your own you know, health and wellness, for your own professional development. You know, if your organization's not giving you uh, ready-made leadership development opportunities, that's not an excuse. You have to create them for yourself. I'm sorry, but you do. You know, you have that opportunity. So I think commit yourself to studying the craft. But but the other thing is to really to be prepared to lead at the next level. To to find your next level, you know, you go through this progression. And I, I think that's the the area that um courage and and being willing to find that authentic view is is just so important. You know, we don't need you to be something other than who you are. We just need gobs and gobs of who you are and, and a willingness to be human and show up in a real human way to other real human beings <laughs> that are in your organization. That's that's what I implore our leaders to please do. Amazing. Love. I love the authorization in the undertone of this conversation, you know, like we're, we're giving you permission and, and as if you needed it, or if you needed it, we're giving you permission to show up as you are. I mean, how liberating is that? And when I say liberating, it makes me think of power, but like in the empowerment sense, right? Like how empowering is that to have permission just to be as we are, even in the context of work? That's where the magic's going to happen, right? Because when you have that permission and you feel that free, you bring all of you to the table. You bring the best of you to the table. And the yeah, results take care of themselves when you do, right? They really do. I think everything flows a lot more smoothly when we're willing to, you know, to uh, move past some of those those outdated beliefs or that sort of baggage that we naturally bring to the table. And I feel like once we start to hit on those areas, once we start to create safer environments for people to operate in, once we establish real trust, not fake trust, real trust, real fairness, right? Real equanimity amongst all of our of, of our people. These are techniques that we need to learn, right? When we think about a true alignment, we don't allow competing goals and scarcity and competing styles to undermine the mission or to disrupt our work together, then all of a sudden, that's a form of enlightened leadership that will help us to be our natural selves in harmony with one another. But here's the thing, if you got the CFO saying, all right, show me the numbers, <laughs> the numbers are there too. Higher levels of innovation and creativity, higher levels of productivity, less absenteeism, less turnover, less people on a ramp learning new jobs because they came in from the outside. All that stuff gets better too. You don't have to choose one or the other. I like to say, you know, if I hand you a coin and I say, put the head in my right hand, put the tails in my left hand, you can't do it because they're inseparable. The same is true of your well-being for your people and the performance of your business. They're just two sides of the same coin. We, for too long, we've told leaders, just focus on the hard bits, focus on the numbers, focus on the ops, the technology. It's not enough anymore. You can't do that anymore. We, we need to take a more holistic approach here. So that's the good news for the CFO. Don't worry about it being woo-woo. It's not. <laughs> this is the good stuff. Let's go there. Yeah. Get the good stuff. The soft skills aren't that soft after all. <laughs> They're not, especially in a highly mechanized future. You know, when you see how much technology has entered, how much digital, everybody's worried about chat GPT and what does this mean? Don't worry. The reality is that the future of business is human. The only time you should worry is if you're not willing to be a human being at work. If you're not willing to treat other people like they're human beings at work, that's the only people who should be worried. And when the robots try to kill us, but. <laughs> and then you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, obviously we, we asked you the legacy question last time you were on the show, but you've that gone on your transformation journey yeah, that's true. significantly. So let's talk about that. Is How has your legacy changed or what's your legacy today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I have very little interest in my own legacy in terms of my name. You know, someday will be erased from the record and I'm totally accepting of that. I'm appreciative of that. But while I'm here, I think that the reality for me is that I want to teach leaders to liberate themselves from these things that are holding us back. I think it's it's 
a chance for us to really let go of that baggage, all that heaviness that you talked about, Rob. I think that get, whether it's giving permission, Susan, to your point, or whether it's giving techniques like I do in the book, that's what I really uh, want to have as, as an impact is giving people the tools and the techniques and the courage and the, the inspiration to kind of find their natural leadership, one that's very harmonious with with how you know our, our universe and our world actually works, and in a way that's in line with what our, our organizations are trying to accomplish, it's absolutely doable. So I feel like when when individual suffering goes down and happiness goes up and we become this, this spillover effect, and on the cover of my book, I, I include this ripple effect because when you put a drop of leadership, the real enlightened kind into the water, these ripples just kind of they can't help but affect those around you and you get enough of that going, man, that's that's the good stuff. So if I have a legacy at all to leave, I think it's knowing that I can help nudge a few people toward, you know, uh, creating those types of ripples. Amazing. And you're definitely leaving a lot of ripples. And for folks out there, if you want to check out the book, Expand the Circle, Enlightened Leadership for Our New World of Work, you can check it out, mattpopesel.com slash circle. I've dropped the, that link in the podcast notes. Obviously, it's available on Amazon as well. And then I've also dra- dropped Matt's LinkedIn in the podcast notes as well. So if you want to connect with him, you can do that there. Or you can check out mattpopesel.com. Matt, is there anywhere else you'd like folks to find you? No, I think those are great. I'm, I'm Matt Pepsel everywhere. Just, uh, I would love to hear from you if you've got any questions about this and just, uh, I, I think there's just, I'm so hopeful when I look at the future of work because I see what's possible. And I see that the reception that I've been getting and seeing and, and just the connections people are making, I, I'm highly encouraged. So if there's any any uh, any way I can be of service, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to do so. Amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. And obviously for us, for everyone listening, please hit subscribe to Leadership Launchpad Project on your favorite podcast platform. Leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. And also, if you found something interesting or some tidbits in this one, shoot it over to any leaders in your life because I'm sure they'll find something as well. And obviously for us, if you want any leadership development, the Aspiring Leaders Program, Conflict Management, EQ, all these types of things that we offer, head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com for all of that. Susan, is there anything you want to leave folks with? I bet you could read my mind right now. (laughs) Matt doesn't know that we use that ripple effect terminology in our locker room with our dream team. That's how that's what we say when we're spreading that powerful, positive ripple effect that we're trying to turn into a tidal wave to change the way the game of business is being played forever by expanding the circle with this type of human-centric, heart-centric leadership. You heard it here, folks. Enlightened leadership is the future. So if you're not on that bus or on that journey towards your enlightenment in the ways that we talked about today, I know I'm going to go out and get this this book, Expand the Circle, for all my dream team, right? Because I just feel like this is such the playbook for the future of leadership. So I really, really, really highly encourage anybody out there listening to do the same for your teams. Absolutely. This is this is the fundamental of what leadership is now, right? And we've had folks, like we started off talking about Dick Schwartz from core psychology, therapy, understanding mindset and how we are and why we are the way we are to people like Matt and David Irvine who are talking about, you know, authenticity and going on this journey. And and then we've had, well, also we've had folks on like Matt the first time where we were talking about mm-hmm. nuts and bolts of how do we assemble a dream team. This is what leadership is now. It's no longer this management 101 style balance sheets. Like, yes, we do that, but the numbers bear it out. and. Like, listen to the Jason Lippert episode. They literally just posted their highest net sales ever of $5.2 billion in 2022. Their turnover is 8% when manufacturing is 40%. And their stock has four and a half X'd in the last 10 years since he's been leaning into development 
both personal and leadership for his folks, right? That's the return on investment. <laughs> and the folks, and he talked about it. He has a huge box of folks who write him and say, thank you for making my dreams happen. Thank you for the family life and that ripple effect there. So get win, your win, box win, and win, start win, win, win. making your <laughs> ripple effect. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It's always amazing to connect with you and we should, yeah, definitely know when you're, you're ready to come back on. Cause we'll, we'll definitely have you for another one. I the love it. Trick. Robin Susan, I love it so much. I look forward to it. Everybody. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you all next week. Bye everyone.